let's uh, let's get started, right? So, so we're all here to take a look at just one more way to you know tackle design automation. Um, so it's a little bit different. Uh, it is embedded in Inventor, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about that first. But let's go ahead and get started with maybe some introductions, right? Um, and you can see the agenda here. We'll get, we'll uh, tackle a couple other subjects. We'll you know uh, define you know what is design automation and tacked on as opposed to just plain old design automation. When should we use it um, and how does it work? And that's the good stuff. That's the part where we get to the demonstration and you can see how, uh, what the interface looks like and the ease of use looks like. Uh, last but not least, we'll take care of uh, some Q and A. Uh, but before that, like I said, let's get started with some introductions. It's been a little while since I think I did an ABA. So uh, some of you guys might already know me, but um, um, if, if you don't, I am a uh, technical solution specialist here at Katif Technology. So I've been here uh, a, a little while, right? Uh, I think I celebrated 17 years uh, this last August. So it's been a little while. But prior to that, my role uh, was as a uh, designer in the RV industry, right? Um, so lots of experience designing recreational vehicles, motorhomes, travel trailers, et cetera. And, uh, if I go back to my role as a technical solution specialist here at Kativ, um, I take you know those 10 years of industry working with not just the CAD tools, but the processes that we um, use to develop products, working with ERP systems, working with sales, working with production, right? I use all that you know, with um, some of the knowledge I have in terms of the, using the tools to typically you know, make recommendations on products, uh, processes, et cetera. Um, that we can recommend for customers to, to put in practice. So a little fun fact here um, in, in terms of, you know, where I came from, uh, some of the things I, I did. Um, in the RV industry, we always had some special projects going. Besides production projects, um, you know, the, the typical run-of-the-mill motorhome travel trailer that you can go out and buy on the lot, we always had special projects. So some of these were um, um, vehicles uh, for marketing purposes for, you know, Red Bull or, you know, Monster or something like that. Sometimes they were special projects for like law enforcement uh, or even uh, medical facilities, right? They would have these mobile, you know, trailers or uh, mobile uh, hospital rooms. Um, an interesting project that I got to work on was this, right? So I'm not sure if you guys recognize it right away, uh, but it is a motorhome pulling a trailer uh, in, you know, that's beefed up a little bit, um, has some off-road capabilities as well. And if you don't recognize it, maybe this will help, right? So this came from Jurassic Park. It was one of the projects that we got to work on. We built three of them, if I remember correctly. You know, two were used on the lot in the movie. Uh, I think the third one traveled around and got used for promotional uh, purposes. So I think they, they put it in, in the, uh, um, I think the last place I saw it was at Universal Studios. So anyways, just a fun fact, a cool thing I got to work on. I got to work on a few projects like that. Um, and with that said, um, let's go ahead and talk a little bit uh, about, you know, where you're at, right? Um, so we're going to go ahead and launch a poll here. So if Christina, if you, could, if you can go ahead and launch the poll, uh, let's take a look and see where people are at. Uh, we've got a couple questions for you guys. So the first one is, you know, do you produce customizable products, right? Yes or no. Uh, some of you guys may be doing, you know, um, things that are built to order and very, very unique, um, as opposed to, you know, things that are customizable, maybe infinitely customizable. Uh, the second question there, I think you'll see is, are you using iLogic today to automate your designs? So that's one way that we talk about um, doing this is through iLogic. I'm sure you've seen other iLogic uh, AVAs or webinars. Um, very, very useful. That's another way to go about this. Um, and the last question is, do you need to create CAD documentation for quotes? Does somebody tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, we need a quote. Can you just kind of figure out a quick version of this assembly that we can quote off of? Right? Is that part of the process? Um, so large majority of you guys are saying yes, right? To that first question, do you produce customizable project, uh, uh, products? Uh, that looks like 80%. Uh, are you using iLogic today? Uh, very surprised, 62% uh, percent of you guys said no, right? 38% um, said yes. Um, and so iLogic, love it, okay? I use it all the time. There's all kinds of crazy stuff you can do. Sometimes you can start to embed, you know, .NET and start to do some, you know, coding inside of there. 
Um, so uh, what we're going to show is going to be a little bit easier to use, um, easier to implement in, in a lot of ways, and you don't have to know, uh, you know, any coding language. Okay. Last but not least, do you create CAD documentation for quotations? Um, and I didn't, I don't know if I saw, yeah, okay. So a large percentage of you guys, again, 69% said yes, right? Um, and so there's a, another percent, the, the remaining 31% said no. So again, uh, a lot of people involved in, you know, working with, you know, uh, a sales environment where you have to create uh, some sales documentation. Okay. So with that said, let's go and answer some questions that we saw a little bit earlier. Um, let's talk about what exactly Tacton Design Automation is. Okay, so basically, right, um, any type of effective management um, of design manage uh, or you know design automation um, is going to require a tool. So Tacton uh, Tacton provides a tool to manage those design variations. It's very consistent. Um, and typically the purpose is to make, you know, sales, design, production of customizable products as simple and as straightforward as if they were standard, right? Um, so it works on a few different levels. So um, we can increase efficiency, right? So when CAD is designed, automated for both sales and manufacturing, um, it can be much, much faster and sometimes, you know, almost completely automatic, okay? So we also want to prove quality. So by enforcing standards through automation, right, and configuring, you know, according to those standards, uh, having that at the heart of your solution, the results are almost always correct, right? And I'll go a little bit further. They're always correct. It's whatever you allowed to happen in that automation. Um, and in a lot of cases, you know, almost all those design errors are eliminated. So we improve quality that way. Now, the third component is, of this is decreasing cost. So if we can automate repetitive non-value uh, tasks that we're you know, tasked with um, and we have to complete very often, then the number of people involved in sales and the design process is hopefully decreased. All of that right, goes towards reducing costs. So that's the ultimate goal with automation in general, but I think Tacton provides you know, some good ways to kind of bring it all together, standardize the way you automate and, um, and in addition, right, there's some other benefits, right? So we'll take a look at those, okay? A another differentiator, we just talked about the whole design automation part of it, right? Some of the benefits configurating or configuring um, your design um, and, and, you know, uh, adhering to your standards and, you know, including sales in the process. So the other part of this, right, that's unique to Tacton is the CPQ portion of this. Right. So if your end goal at some point, maybe not today, but maybe in the future, is to enable sales, right, to do this on their own, or even enable the end customer to do this on their own through a website, through another interface where they don't even need CAD. Right. Then, then what we have on the right hand side, Tacton provides a CPQ option, an option to basically take our design automation, give it an interface that makes it simple for sales and even end users, uh, customers to interact with what they need, right? The configuration part of it and create uh, documentation, create quotes, et cetera. You know, something that looks a little bit more like this, right? It can be hosted on a website um, and, you know, placed there so that, you know, you're almost completely out of the loop here. Uh, the only exception to that is when somebody actually submits what they're looking for, what they want, you might get a notification, some contact information that says, hey, somebody was looking at your website and they were interested in the quote on this component. Okay. So today we're going to be focused more on the other side of things, right? The design automation um, and specifically within Inventor. So again, another good thing, another benefit to using Tacton is that it, it also integrates with other tools like SolidWorks and, and Creo. So the things I'm gonna show you today uh, work almost identical in both of those tools. Um, so that's another part of this, it's consistent. And there's you know plenty of our customers have multiple CAD systems. So I, I think this could be a benefit. In fact, some customers, somebody I talked to recently had legacy SolidWorks data. They don't wanna recreate it in Inventor, and so they got half and half. They got legacy data in SolidWorks, legacy data or newer data in Inventor. Uh, it's something they, they switched to. 
they could potentially implement this in both situations. And again, today our focus is going to be on the design automation portion of it. Okay. Um, later on, if you want to move towards the CPQ or enable, you know, that automation to, to be done uh, outside of your organization uh, or extend it, you know, out to the public, we can talk about CPQ. Okay. So um, the next component of this, right, is you know, how does this happen or what are the, some of the benefits? Um, so I, I, what's unique about this, it's easy to implement, right? So dependencies between product parameters, they're, they're expressed concisely in your configuration model uh, with constraints, okay? It's also easy to use. And I think you'll see that throughout the presentation is we'll talk about how easy it is to implement, easy to use, easy to maintain as well, right? So on the, on the use part of it, right? This empowers users uh, to be able to create this automation. Um, and, and it's, you know, the interface that you'll see here, it's an add-in inside of Inventor, allows you to simply pick on components and start to make those connections between uh, parameters or constraints, et, et cetera, and make those, um, uh, connect those dots between, you know, what's possible, what's available in your model or, or in your product, okay? Generates multiple solutions. So, you know, traditionally, you might have to generate, you know, uh, various iterations. Um, this, you sort of just give it the possibilities. What is possible to connect and put together within an assembly? So if a component has five variations, if component number two has 10 variations, right? And they make an assembly, right? You could easily multiply those and get, you know, all these iterations of that. You add a third component and then exponentially, we've got more components that are possible. Okay, uh, you don't have to generate those ahead of time. Um, you could specify them in a chart, what's possible, what's not possible. You could do it through parameters. There's a number of ways to do that. And last but not least, the, the maintenance part of it. There are fewer rules than in a typical automation environment, right? And, and it just makes it easy to, to uh, maintain as a result of that. The tools that you interface to maintain are consistent, right? Um, so. Again, that architecture lends itself to almost anybody learning it fairly quickly and being able to maintain um, some of the, the, uh, the automation that you have uh, now and in the future, okay? So why, when should I use it? So if you take a look at some of the examples here, right? Lots of you guys mentioned you guys have customizable products, right? So that any combination of these bullet points might you know, make you a good candidate for using Tacton automation. Um, if you need to create, you know, CAD documentation, that's a good component of this. Um, if you customize uh, production documentation for every order, right, uh, based on what somebody's spec'd out, this might be a good use case for you. And I think the last bullet point, if you want to go from um, having to tap an engineer who specifically puts these components together, has knowledge of the product, et cetera, to just go CTO, configure to order, where somebody is going through a dialog box and the dialog knows that this component does not match or go with this component. Um, if we wanna embed that type of engineering knowledge, if you wanna go from um, that engineer to order to CTO uh, environment, uh, this is a good option for you. Um, and it can help you know, speed up these processes, maintain those standards that you know, hopefully enforce quality um, and decrease the cost of just creating those documents. And okay. so um, I think a, a slide got missed here, but I do want to talk a little bit about the, the next question that we were uh, you know, asking, right? So how do we go about this, right? If you know already, when do I want to use this? Um, if you know already your end goal is to get to that CPQ option, I'm going back to you know the slide I show uh, I showed a little bit earlier. If you know the end goal is to get on to you know get this product on your website in a configurable manner, this is again a really good solution because it offers a path to that. It's a separate product um, that adds on, stacks on on top of what I'm going to use, but it uses it directly. Okay. In addition that CPQ component can connect to things like ERP, et cetera, uh, to make this uh, you know, that much more useful. So now things are being ordered through ERP and it's integrated 
um, notifications are being sent out, et cetera. Um, even customers can be entered into a CRM system. Okay. So again, that's if your goal is this, you know, this is a, again, a place where you might want to be. So how does it work? Right. And this is the, the meat of all of this. Um, so working inside of the Tacton design automation, you'll find, um, again, that it's, you know, the mantra here, easy to implement, easy to maintain, easy to use. I think you'll see that in here in just a moment. There's two components that make this work. Design Automation Studio, right? Uh, this is where you do the bulk of the work. You author the automation. We write rules, equations. Um, you know, the, you don't see a whole lot of coding here. There's no coding. Um, you map them to the CAD file. So these exist separately, these rules and equations. You define the user interface that you want users to, you know, utilize while they're, you know, automating their design. Uh, you connect drawings. If drawings are necessary, you connect those drawings. And if there's any other documents, like a Word document, you connect those as well, okay? So you author with the design uh, studio, and then you deploy using what's called design automation engineer, okay? That's where users will actually ut utilize the interface that you've created and begin to create, you know, these configurable uh, components, okay? So let's take a look now at the software part of things um, and, and take a look at how this happens inside of Inventor. So inside of Inventor, uh, I'm going to move this Zoom meeting interface here. Um, if you've installed the Tacton design automation tools, you'll see a tab here, a tab here, one for studio, one for design engineer. And um, I think what I'll do is I'll walk you through a already configured model, and then I'll configure a basic model. So if I take a look at this model here, this model already has some automation uh, tacked on design automation uh, connected to it. In fact, it's asking me, hey, there's a TCX file, whatever that is, right? This is the file that makes the connections between all the parameters that are inside this model and the automation that we'll, we've built inside of Tacton. So I'll say yes. Okay. Uh, it'll open up Design uh, Automation Studio and um, it's open in the background here. We can show it or hide it, right? So it becomes, you know, a part of the interface. This is a, basically a, a toggle. And so the file gets created here. And um, uh, this is where we make some of the connections. Now, before I go into how this happens, let's go ahead and take a look and see how this works. So for the user, the way this is gonna look, right? This is, there's a number of configurations here. Um, if I just go ahead and just kind of uh, play the, the automation, uh, I'll get a, an interface here that shows uh, two things, right? The dialog box that they're gonna work with. So in this case, you're expected to put in the customer information, okay? And then you start getting product dimensions. Okay, so if my conveyor has a total length, total width, et cetera, you can control how these uh, interactions happen. So in this case, it's with a slider, right? And I can just make these changes this way by dragging the slider. Um, I could also simply click on the value and you can see that happening, um, you know, real time here. I can click on the value and control it and tell it to be exactly, you know, uh, 1500 um, centimeters. I believe that's in centimeters. Um, there's tool tips that get added on so you can see, you know, what do people mean by this, right? It, it's, what's the total length? What's the min? What's the max? You can embed information into that. Um, so again, total width here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and type that in as uh, 250. Okay. And I start to get immediate feedback uh, on this. Now, as I go here, you'll see references to yellow and green, right? And so yellow are things that are possible. You can see here, uh, I'm sorry, green are things that are you know good to go, that are possible, that are valid. If I try to make the slider for the package minimum length lower, right, it'll let me know, hey, there's a conflict. I can't do that, right? The minimum value is X, you know, number of centimeters. And so I have to reject that, right? And um, I don't have an option. I can't go less than 200 here. Um, so in another case here, as I start to move on, the other way you can specify options, right? Is to do sort of a pick list here. What fence type do I want to use? What roller type do I want to use? And you can see we can embed pictures here. Okay, so I'd like to use this really fast motor for my conveyor. And um, you'll notice not only did it change 
the motor, right? But it changed the fence. Okay, so I get the same type of interface here with all the adjacent components. Green is good. So when I pick the motor, and that's the only thing I pick, there's a lock symbol to let me know this is what I've picked from the standard, um, from the, the initial model. I haven't picked a, a roller. It's just what was there by default. I haven't picked a, a speed fence. It picked it for me, okay? Now, in my mind, I, I'm thinking, why can't I just have the standard fence? And you can see it's marked in yellow. Uh, it's not valid. So when I try to pick it, it says, hey, it's just not available with that larger motor. It doesn't work with that, right? And so here, you start to see in the pull downs, again, it's not available with this faster, larger motor. It is available with 450 or 250 RPM motors, um, or uh, I think even the, the 100, right? Um, so I can go back down, right, and make that initial fence uh, selection valid by choosing 450, clicking OK, right? And I'm back to something that we can actually support and build. And so as I start to click down on some of the other options, there's a lot of uh, information here that we can embed that would be read only. What's the velocity of this conveyor? Uh, what's the price so far as configured? So I start to see some of that, okay? And so as I move down the line, there's more we can do, right? So this is a configuration part, okay? Um, and then if I go here, there's documentation attached to this. Uh, I may have uh, just a drawing. I may have you know, more than one drawing here, uh, but now when I go ahead and select this, I can double click this and have it update the drawing. And you can see it initially brought up the drawing uh, with a different size, but it conformed to you know, the size that I have now. And I can always go back into the interface, go back here and make changes, and of course have the drawing update. Okay. If I go a little bit further, right, more documents can be generated. So I can create a quotation with a bill of material. Um, I, can, I can do both of these. I'm gonna go ahead and double click on these. And in my other window here, it basically generated uh, a quote for me. So let's change my view to a print layout. There we go, that looks better. Um, and so there's my quotation, there's my customer information that we might've filled out. Um, and there's a table of contents. So this is formatted. You can go ahead and you know, create your own templates with your own logos, et cetera. And um, there's you know, all the information that we put into the uh, to configurator is here. So what was the total length? 1500. What was the total width, et cetera, right? All those little specs that we put in, the standard fence. And then as we go down, we also included a bill of material. So I need one standard fence, one beam, uh, 37 rollers, right? And the width is, you know, the size is 250 millimeters. Um, so lots of information gets generated from here. Um, so we'll take a look at how we do this in just a moment. Uh, with a very simple uh, component. And you can see um, here, we could add a whole lot more information, things like discounts, the total sales prices here, uh, service agreements, none are offered, but you could start to add all, all kinds of information. So that just happened, you know, just in a few minutes. I'll go ahead and close this, okay? And we'll, uh, we'll start to configure our own model. It'll be a bit simpler, but I think you'll get the picture, okay? so. With that said, uh, let's go ahead and close this, close this, and close the drawing, and close our model as well. All right, so let's start with this basic assembly. Um, parts already you know, constrained there, not a whole lot of you know, formulas or anything here. So if I double click on the uh, cylinder here, all right, and I take a quick peek, um, there is a diameter and a height here um, available. So, you know, I've got parameters that can, I can control, but no iLogic, no formulas necessarily here. Um, and the same thing when it comes down to uh, the block. Okay, so the block that's sitting on top of this has some basic parameters, height, depth, width, uh, et cetera. And um, so fairly simple. Let's go ahead and get to our Studio. This is where we're going to author this. And I'm going to go ahead and show this here this way. This is still showing the, the previous uh, file that we were looking at the conveyor. I'm going to create a new model here. So within Tacton Design Automation Studio, you create new files, new models, right? Uh, you'll eventually save them. So I'll go ahead and give this a name. 
And let's go ahead and put, put this here with block assemble. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait on this, but it's asking me, hey, do I want to connect this model? Uh, so I'm going to wait on that for just a sec. Now, in the design tree, this is a whole other you know, entity of world here. We're going to create components. So this first top component is going to represent my um, assembly. And so I'll name it accordingly. This is like building an assembly inside of Inventor, except we're doing it within Tacna. Uh, I'll add a component. And this component is going to represent the block. Okay. I'll add a second component. I'm just right clicking and adding components here. And this next component is going to represent the cylinder. Okay. So I got two components here. As I move along here, um, if I want to add numbers, values um, that are going to control this, I can do it here. So um, let's start with the cylinder. If I start with the cylinder, I want to control the diameter. And it doesn't matter what you named the, the, the values here, as opposed to you know, the, the values that are in the model. They can be the same. They can be different. You can still make those connections. So I'm going to add that attribute, and I'm going to go ahead and call it diameter. Okay. So there's something I want to control there. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and also add a length. Okay. Uh, I'm also going to add a status. Okay. So I think the first two are fairly obvious. Uh, the second or the last one is not so obvious. So the diameter, I'm just going to go ahead and make um, any value from two to nine. So as, as soon as I eliminate the whatever was there, INT for integer, you can see all the different ways we can specify this. This can also be connected to a table so that we can you know, draw the values or pull the values from the table. But for right now, I'm just gonna create what's called a float value. I want it to be anywhere from two, oops, I created a new attribute there in accident. Okay, so two dot dot nine, Right, that's a range now. Anywhere from two to nine, that's what my diameter can be. Uh, on the length portion of it, okay, uh, anywhere from three to 10, right? And you also see the option for comma. So if I wanna add an, a, a comma here and also add you know, a jump uh, or a step to 12, right, I can do that. And I, I just deleted uh, a portion of this. But um, I'm, I think I'm gonna go ahead and leave this at three to 10, okay? And then the status here, what's that gonna do? That's basically gonna turn my cylinder on and off, and that's gonna be a uh, Boolean operation, okay? That's just gonna be a yes or a no, okay? And I'll do the same thing for my block, okay? So within my block, um, you know, what do I wanna do? I wanna determine uh, the size of the block, okay? So I'm gonna have a parameter or a value, at what they call an attribute, right? So I gotta do a little translation here, but this is gonna be my size attribute, okay? And uh, this is gonna be anywhere from three to 10, okay? And there's you know, other algebraic expressions that you can put in here. Um, so I've got information now that I can you know, correlate to the cylinder, the block size. I wanna be able to customize it by size, cylinder by diameter, length, status, on or off, et cetera. Okay, so what do we do next here? We're gonna go ahead and map uh, this information to the model. It's not connected to the model just yet. Um, so if I right click here, and that's always the right answer in any program on how to connect things, you right click on it, okay? And you can see lots of options. This is also a place where I could have added you know, attributes and. Uh, this is the, you know, a, another place where I'll come back to and, and do more things. But I'll go ahead and map the model, the CAD model, to the information on the right. So these calculations, the, the, the formulations of, of, of the results that you're putting in happen outside of CAD. So that's one of the things that makes this efficient is the math that happens, the rules, um, you know, being generated or, or conformed to happen outside of the CAD model and then get pushed to the CAD model. So 
I'm going to go ahead and tell it, okay, I want to go ahead and map this to um, this information to the assembly. So if I pick the assembly, I, I'm going to pick here first. I can browse, you know, to an assembly, but if I pick here first, uh, the uh, dialog box is, is blue. It now uh, allows me to select this. There we go. And it's mapped to the assembly. Okay. Now that it's mapped to the assembly, I can go to the parameters tab, right? And start making connections to uh, some of the parameters, you know, from there on down, right? So uh, if there's parameters here, um, you know, I can make that connection here uh, to other things. Um, I'm actually gonna do this at the block level. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, close this here. Let's go do this at the block level here. There we go. And let's map the block. Okay, so map to the block and then uh, the parameters that I see here, um, it reads the parameters that are inside the block. So I have the height, okay, I've added that. I've added the depth and now I've added the width. Okay, so I have a parameter that's called size and I want that to be basically connected to um, you know, other things. So I'm gonna go ahead and map the depth. I'm gonna highlight that. And in this pull down, you can see here, it reads some of the other parameters within my tacked on model, the size, uh, was something that was connected to my block model. So I'm connecting CAD to Tacton, right? And so that was the depth. The width is also gonna be connected. So when I pick the width, I can go and tell it, hey, I also want it to be connected to the size. So even though they're different names, I'm gonna use the size parameter to control both the width and the depth. All right, so uh, next thing, let's go and take a look at the cylinder, right? So I'll go ahead and click okay to that. I'll right click on the cylinder here um, and let's go ahead and map that as well. Okay. And so from here, I can pick the cylinder. You can see it's mapped and uh, let's go ahead and add uh, parameters here. Okay. So uh, we'll see the, um, the parameters available here. I'm gonna go ahead and map this to the height and map this to the diameter as well. Okay, and with the, uh, uh, the parameter value here, I'm gonna go ahead and click on, uh, let's go ahead and click on height here. And let's go ahead and map that to length in my tacton map model. So again, the parameter names don't have to match and you can sort of mix and match here uh, your tacton model on the right to your CAD model. Okay, so uh, more things. If we go back to the, the uh, component tab and you can see there's other things we can control, properties, patterns, uh, we can add more complex information here, right? Um, and all along the while, uh, all along here, uh, while we're configuring this, um, you know, we should be able to also control when things are on, when things are off. So here, we're gonna go ahead and um, control the state of this cylinder and connect it to the status. Okay, so status, yes or no, that's gonna control whether this is visible or not. Okay, so uh, I make those connections um, there. Uh, I, I don't think I actually clicked okay to mapping the assembly. Um, you can tell by the way, whether things are mapped and connected to a CAD model by the way they look. So that block looks different, the block and the cylinder are both uh, mapped, the assembly is not. So I'll just take that one more step here and map to uh, the assembly. All right, and we're good to go there. Okay, so maybe the next step here is to add some kind of interface for the user to work with. Um, so if we go here, Here's where the user interface is, um, and there's nothing on the right-hand side. If you right-click there, I'm gonna add an application. And so we can name the application. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and call it my, you know, block configurator, right? And you can go ahead and, you know, control the size of that, how that shows up. And then underneath that, we're gonna add steps, okay? 
I only need one step, but if you, if you have a multiple step process, uh, you can put these in order so that, you know, you configure, you know, certain components or certain parameters first, then second, and then third, right? So I'm gonna stick with this uh, single step here. Um, I can name it again, config assembly, okay? Uh, you can put a description here. This is what's gonna be visible to the user. Okay, and you can put in a description. Okay, this is a verbose description. Um, and I'll put in, this allows you to configure your assembly, right? Um, you could also put pictures, right? Just to help the, you know, along the process. So, okay, um, let's go to the next step here. I'm gonna right click and add a group. Um, so within the dialog box, you can kind of group things together um, and you can put, you know, all the block related options in one location and maybe rename this group to block. So maybe I'll put block uh, options. And again, you can put a description here. You can make it long. You can add a picture. Uh, I'm gonna leave it uh, fairly simple here. I'm gonna default it to expanded so that users, as they expand this area, they'll be able to um, uh, immediately see the options and start to interact with them. Okay, now within that group, I can start adding fields, okay? So these are the fields that are gonna start, you know, um, allowing me to connect to other things. And I think the easiest way, because we need to connect this to other things, right? We need to connect these to parameters. We could do it here, okay? I'm gonna delete this. Um, and so the easiest way to do this is actually to go back to the components comp uh, uh, part of this. Um, and start to add that information. So when I look at the size here, uh, we should be able to uh, create a field from the attribute, right? To that config, uh, that configuration assemble field under block. Okay, so now I have that block size field added in here. Okay, I could decide how am I gonna interact with this? Do I just wanna put a number? Do I want a text box? Do I want a slider? Okay, so I'll make it a slider. Um, and uh, again, look at the options here, text box, none, et cetera. Um, so I got lots of options here. Okay, so I'm gonna have a slider for that. Uh, let's go back and add another group, All right? So this group is gonna be for the cylinder. Okay, and I'll put, you know, cylinder options. Okay, and I'll also default this to expanded here um, as well. You can change the order, so you can you know right click and you know bump this up, move this up. If you want people to see block first or cylinder first, this is the, the right order for me. And I'm going to go back to components here, uh, the cylinder options, and you can see what I've got so far. Okay, um, so there's the um, the length, status, etc. And I think I'm missing something here. Let's go ahead and map this to. Uh, I might have not put that in there. I'm going to go ahead and make it equal to uh, the length in this case. Okay, uh, so these are the things I want to control here. Uh, the length and the status, um, I'm, I'm going to leave this one out because I don't think I've got this working quite right. But um, uh, right here, um, I can go ahead and add this to our, whoops, our dialogue, right? So. Do I want to add it as part of the block, part of the cylinder, et cetera? I'm going to make it part of the cylinder, right? That cylinder area. So you're always going to want to test this. So this is that authoring environment. Um, now, before I do that, you know, here's the cylinder length field. I want to go ahead and just put in a, um, a drop down list or make it read only. I'm going to create a drop down list here for the cylinder status field. Same thing, drop down list. Um, that's going to be basically on or off, et cetera. And there's all kinds of other things we can show. We can show what's the expression look like. So if you create formulas in here that says, you know, one equals the other, et cetera, you can display those. 
Okay, you can control the number of decimal points that are shown. You can show the order in which you get your options, right? You can control some of that. Okay, so you always want to test this out. And what I will do here is, you know, I'll start this runtime. This this lets me sort of run this dialog box and see what the users see before, you know, pushing it out to everybody. Okay, so I'll go ahead and hit play. Okay. Um, and here's a dialog box. Um, now, this is what we're going to be interacting with is the studio runtime component here. Um, this is a, a preview of the dialog box. And this is what I put in so far. Block size, right, um, starts to let me use the slider. Okay. And obviously, if I put in something like uh, 15, right, it says it's not valid. Right. And, and so I have no choice but to go, you know, cancel that out and go back to what I have here. So um, the cylinder status, it's it defaulted to no. I might want that the default to yes. Right. But this is where I can go ahead and bring that back. And then I can control other values uh, here. Right. So um, I just made that a little bit larger. Right. And uh, I have the diameter connected to the length. So it's, you know, six uh, units high, six units in diameter. That's the way I designed it, okay? So uh, there's a whole lot more we can do in terms of you know, adding some functionality, adding you know, to the way this, this works. Uh, for right now, I think what I'm gonna do in the, in the interest of time is just connect the drawing to it. Um, so I'll close out of this, right? There is no drawing with this. Um, I'll close out of this and come back to uh, my dialog box where I start to customize this. And so uh, for the CAD mapping, right, I can go to CAD mapping again for the assembly. And you can see there's a whole, you know, separate area here that allows me to connect uh, a drawing. So I could browse to that drawing uh, if I had it open. In fact, um, maybe I should just open it. Um, so let's go to, there's my drawing. All right. So I might want to make some changes, you know, like changing the scale here to, you know, one quarter. Okay. Um, so this is the drawing I want to connect to. It's already connected to the assembly, but in terms of Tacton, Tacton has no awareness of this, right? So I'm just going to, you know, highlight this area, the selected document area, and there it is. It's connected. Okay. So again, I make some changes here or I start to, to play this or preview this. Okay. Um, I start to look at my options here as I configure them. And, you know, right now the option is no. Uh, so if I look at the assembly, right, uh, we can basically, you know, have this update and configure accordingly. So let's go ahead and set this to yes and set it to no one more time. And let's, let's make sure we can update this. I may need to close this once. and reopen it. All right. So when I open it again, it already knows it's connected to all of this uh, here. Let's go ahead and preview it. There we go. And it starts off again with this off. Um, if I go to um, this part of it, right, again, we can make some changes to the configuration. Uh, but if you remember, the drawing already had a cylinder, it was a different size, etc. Um, and as I start to look here, you can see the drawings connected. And if I double click, I can get the latest, greatest version of that drawing as configured here without the cylinder and, you know, continue to make changes, you know, once I come back to this configurator. Okay. So super short, brief introduction on how this is done. Um, just for, you know, your knowledge, you know, the way this gets used by the consumer, the user, right? Um, these models can be saved in a standard location. And the way they, they uh, work with this is using the engineer component, uh, component of this. 
Okay, so if they start the engineer component, um, if we point them to, uh, and let's go ahead and close this. All right. Um, if we start the engineer component of this and um, um, we can point them to existing models, right? Whether it's this conveyor assembly, et cetera. Uh, we got options here where we can connect them to these. Uh, you can create a library of existing conveyors, uh, automated assemblies, et cetera. And right now I have these three. Um, so when I start the engineer, I get this option. So do I wanna start with this assembly, this assembly, um, and this is the conveyor assembly I had just a moment ago. And users start to use this uh, here as a, a, a way to start their automation uh, component, right? So I'll go ahead and say yes. And they start to quickly start uh, to be presented with the configurator options here for this uh, design. They configure, they can save it and create a new iteration of it. Of course, you know, create their drawings uh, like we saw here or, you know, quotation documents. That's how they interact with it after it's published. And there's other tools to kind of see um, what you've uh, done so far and debug if necessary, uh, et cetera. So, with that said, I'm going to come back to uh, my presentation here for just a second. All right, so let's go ahead and take um, uh, some questions. Right, I didn't see, I didn't get the, a chance to look at the Q and A or some of the questions that were in there. Um, I don't see any questions being launched there, but let's take a look at the chat as well. Okay. So um, some questions there, is Tacton a yearly subscription and what's the cost? So I, I think I'll probably defer that to uh, one of our team members and maybe put you in co uh, contact with them. I think uh, that's Sean's question, okay? Um, and uh, Brian Kelly, I'm not sure what your question was. You were asking about beefed up a little bit. That was probably referring to something I mentioned or said you know, in the... Uh, in the presentation, but I'm curious um, if there's other questions in regards to what we just showed uh, here. Um, we do have a question in the Q and A. Um, Stephen would like to know how will this work with iLogic? Um, oh, good question. Excellent question. So the more of the logic that you can take out of the model and put into um, uh, and put into um, the Tacton. Uh, engine right um, inside a studio. The more that you can do, the better it will work. Right at the same time, there's certain things that iLogic can do. Right, you just won't be able to do in in Tacton. So you put in, you connect the parameters that drive the iLogic. So if the length is, um, uh, if the length is, you know, um, has some iLogic tied to it, all you need to connect the Tacton to drive it is the length, right? And let the iLogic do its thing in the background. But if you want it to run as efficiently as possible, if you can move some of that logic, some of those calculations, uh, some of that iLogic is probably, could be very simple. And it, it, it's probably a good candidate to be moved over inside of Tacton uh, where you create you know, algebraic formulas, et cetera. Uh, if you start getting into .NET, et cetera, then maybe you wanna keep it in iLogic, but it does work with iLogic. Great. He he also asks, can you copy an existing model with Tacton to a new environment? Absolutely. So yes, that is the goal. So when I launched it last, um, that that conveyor system, that is so that I can basically you know create a brand new version of that assembly, and then um, uh, you know create a new drawing and assembly and components there that are unique to that you know configuration. Um, the other thing that you are able to do is nest the automation uh, component. So let's just say you have sub-assembly number one, right? Which is maybe a motor uh, and all the little things that get configured there, right? All kinds of sub-assemblies, et cetera. Uh, you could bring that into an assembly and bring in another configured assembly uh, into a, a higher level assembly. So you could start nesting some of that automation uh, within a single assembly. Right. And, and while we're answering questions, I'm going to go ahead and just put up the next slide. 
um, you know, in terms of next steps. If you guys have more questions, um, you can contact both um, either myself or uh, Max Mirabaz on our team. Um, you can see our, our email addresses there. Um, you know, if, if you're looking to see more of a personalized demo or just, you know, have a conversation about, you know, how this fits within your product um, and what you guys do and how you want to extend maybe out to a online configurator, by all means. Um, if you need a trial license, those are available, uh, right? And um, I found that the help attached to this was pretty good. I started working with this and getting uh, to make these connections, the automation portion of it. Uh, right, just from help. And then, you know, I work with other people to get a little bit further. Uh, another thing I'll do real quick before we jump off, um, I'll go ahead and bring up a, a customer website. So there, this customer, this is Tacton Automation um, here uh, for this customer who builds, um, you know, cylinders, right? And so they have the, they've gone a step further and taken, de and taken design automation to the web. Um, and this is the CPQ component that allows you to, you know, start to configure this and make choices occur, uh, accordingly, right? So uh, you can see the different choices here, right? Configuration is happening in terms of cost, et cetera, immediately. The CAD model is not updating just yet, uh, but, you know, I'm making some changes here, right? Some of these changes are going away based on, you know, the, the configuration I'm creating. So some of these are grayed out. And you can see the cost is uh, being generated $122. I think there's a European version as well. And then the CAD model is no longer up to date. So you update the preview. Uh, this is not necessarily using Inventor in the background. Uh, this is using like a simplified version of that CAD model. Uh, and it doesn't really care whether it came from Inventor, ProE, or SOLIDWORKS, right? So this is the unique configuration after I hit update that I've configured. That's great. Um, we do have a couple more questions. Um, so Jim would like to know, is Tacton only available for Inventor 2022? Oh, no. Uh, it's, it, I don't remember how far back it goes, but I know that, that for sure the version that I saw recently um, was, I think, at 2018 or 2019. So I don't know how far back it goes, but it definitely goes a few releases back. Great. And then um, finally, um, Jeff said that he jumped on a little late and he would like to, he says, I know that Tacton uses an online configurator as well. Does this connect to a machine on your local machine or is it processed on a remote server somewhere? Uh, it's typically a remote server, right? And, and so I, I shouldn't say remote. It could be on-premise or it could be on the cloud. So you, you, it doesn't care you know, which one you use. You, you do have either option. Uh, right. And, and honestly, when it comes to that, um, it almost it, to me, it makes more sense to do that on the cloud um, just because of the, the backup options and redundancy in, in terms of backup. Um, I think it's super helpful. Great. Right. And I saw uh, Sean there had a question. You know, how would you compare Tacton to Forge? So. Um, you know, there's a lot of similarities, right? But Forge is a really broad platform and you have to create a front end for it, okay? Uh, you have to create a front end um, to connect to Forge and get that online configuration tool up and running. Um, Tacton offers a, a front end to, to, I guess, to be able to, you know, hand over um, turnkey solution with the front end, right? Where as with Forge, you're gonna have to most likely uh, work with a web developer to create the front end and then start making it talk to Forge and, and make those connections between the parameters, the interface, et cetera. This lets you design a lot of the interface there, the options that are there uh, early, right off the bat, and then make the connections to already a pre-configured uh, Tacton um, um, web interface. Great, that looks like um, that's all of our questions that we have. Um, thank you so much for coming on and leading this session, Hav. Um, it was very informative and, and I'm really thankful that you came on today and taught us something new. Cool, glad to be here. Great, thank you everyone for joining and we hope to see you at next week's ABA session. Thank you so much for coming. 
All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.